We're going to start by sharing a little of our story and then we'll have a lot of time for questions and, and responses. So 30 years ago, I woke up to the news. I was living in London that a bomb had gone off at the Grand Hotel and within eight hours I heard the news that they found my dad's body. Now, I didn't just lose my father in that bomb. I lost, I lost part of me that felt like I was a free spirit that had no responsibilities and was roaming the world. And I felt part of the conflict in Northern Ireland. And so within two days I started on a journey, a journey of wanting to understand those who killed my father. It was the IRA who said they were responsible of bringing something positive out of it. And it's been a long journey, as you can imagine. I never thought that 30 years on I would be here in Brighton with Pat McGee and with all of you. The journey was about not wanting to blame and not wanting to judge, not wanting to make someone an enemy. And part of that was wanting to actually meet Pat McGee and to hear his story. And after we had the peace process, in 1999, Patrick was released from prison and I was able to contact him in 2000. I remember the day so well, in November, I was living in North Wales, looking after my three young daughters, preparing to go to Ireland, to Dublin on the ferry from Holyhead, when I got a phone call from Anne Gallagher, my fantastic friend who sadly is no longer with us, and she said she'd arranged for Patrick to be at her house that evening. And she said, can you be there? And my first thought was, I'm really not in the mood, it's the wrong day. Can it be another day? But I decided to, to go with the day and trusted it was the right day. And how could it be the right day? What would I feel? It's such a massive thing to be crossing that ferry, knowing that Patrick McGee would be at the end. We just met in a friend's kitchen, it was very relaxed. And I remember Patrick walking in and we shook hands and I thanked him for coming and we wanted to be in our own room and we were for three hours that was the first meeting. And my aim was to listen, I was curious, who was he beyond the label? And the first half of the conversation was very much about Patrick explaining to me the political reasons why he joined the IRA, what was going on in his community at the time. And I listened and I asked lots of questions and I shared how close I'd been to my father that summer and also my experience of being in Belfast in 85 and 86. And I was thinking, I'm getting what I want out of this. I'm seeing Patrick as a human being. I'm seeing his humanity, his sensitivity. But I probably won't come back for a second meeting because he is completely justifying killing my father. And just when I thought that, something happened. Patrick stopped talking and he looked at me and he said, I don't know who I am anymore. I want to hear your anger and your pain. What can I do to help you? And in that moment I knew he'd taken off his political hat and opened up, become vulnerable. And the conversation was very different after that. And now, after another hour and a half, I couldn't sustain it anymore. And I thanked him for coming and said, I need to go. And he said that he was really sorry that he killed my dad. <coughs> Thanks, Joe. Um, I'm, I'm finding uh, this difficult, and I often find it difficult when I'm sharing a platform uh, with Joe. We've met since that first meeting on more than... Um, I think 130 occasions, venues like this, uh, conferences, you know, done media work together, we spoke at universities, schools, we went into prisons to speak, varied activity but enormous contact considering I killed Joe's father. Uh, and I'm in Brighton now and it's 30 years from the, the, the date of the, the Brighton bombing, so it's particularly Poignant. There's a complete understatement. It's um, it's, hard, it's difficult. But I, I'm also in wonder that Joe has kept this dialogue going for all of that time, 14 years. 
and even now on a day like today that you might expect to be very private she would wish to share with family or alone that she's um, infested this uh, trust in me to invite me here to be part of this and I feel humbled by it and honoured by it and very very touched by it going back to that um, first meeting 24th of November uh, 2000 in Dublin I'd heard um, some six months prior to that that somebody connected with Brighton wanted to meet me now I'd been out of uh, prison because of the Good Friday Agreement the prisoner release was a big part of that agreement I'd been out of prison about um, uh, 17 months and I got out with a clear view in my head as most Republicans getting out had a clear view what do we do now what can I do what can we do to contribute to building on this piece and I thought uh, well one of the big outstanding issues that has to be addressed is the question of the past uh, and a big part of the past is the hurt we did the hurt we inflicted in the course of our campaign and that meant sitting around uh, tables talking to former enemies whether it be squaddies British army squaddies uh, RUC people uh, the whole gamut of people were involved in either side of that conflict, and all sides of that conflict, loyalists, etc. Uh, um, you know, competing Republican groups. This seemed to be a necessary part of the deal with the legacy. Meeting victims fitted in exactly with that. And so when somebody told me somebody connected with Brayden wanted to uh, meet me, um, I, I would have been very ready for that. I'd, I'd have thought this is an obligation as a Republican, as a, as a somebody been involved uh, for a long time in that struggle. It was an obligation to continue uh, addressing some of these um, uh, legacy issues. And I went along to that meeting, uh, I, I think, firmly with this intent that I'll go along under this political obligation, I would sit down, I would try hopefully with some sensitivity to explain uh, my motivation for that particular operation and the motivation for people like, of people like me. And I thought, well, that'll be it. Um, I, I, you would hope that some good would come from that, that it might begin that word closure, perhaps. But of course, <laughs> You don't know really what to expect, and it all came crowding in on me. The enormity of what I was about to do just before I, I entered into the house where Joe was. This woman was, I didn't know. This woman as Joe Berry. It was a it was the daughter of a, a guy who was killed in that operation, and that's all I knew. And there was people in the house, um, you know, friends of mine, friends of Joe's. And I think the idea was in that kind of an informal atmosphere that it would draw the sting out of the moment, maybe, and allow us at least to, you know, ask a few questions and be civil. And, but I, I found that quite overwhelming, even at that stage. And to the extent I, I felt that I couldn't really um, um, give due respect to the moment and what was required of me with witnesses to it. Um, I it seemed too intimate to sure. I, I guess too that I was um, conscious that I could let myself down in front of people. Uh, as I'm saying, the, the impact on me at that moment was enormous. And we, um, we were, others in the room, uh, uh, the person whose house we were in, a friend of ours, um, I think a uh, savvy person she picked up on this. And uh, was feeling, I believe, the same. Ushered us into a, a, a sort of a conservatory. And we sat alone and talked for three hours. I wasn't conscious of it being three hours, but told afterwards. And it began with that um, explanation of the motivation 
the political reasons for the, the IRA campaign, etc. But I'm picking up while I'm doing this, and Joe's asking questions, and she's also talking about her father and her family, and I'm picking up, this is a person who's really there with great dignity, poise, um, intelligence, and she's, the questions are asking clearly indicates that she, she knows her own mind, and she's thought long and hard about this. It getting a picture of this woman giving you real attention, and you've hurt her, you've killed her father. And you got to remember, for years, Republicans um, had been stereotyped, particularly in the British media, as terrorists, as drug dealers, as some sort of a parasite on their communities, um, and then censored as well. And then here's this woman who, less than anybody, has given me uh, acute attention to what I'm saying listen respectively, asking good questions. And, and I, I found that experience, hadn't expected, hadn't anticipated for a second, I, I found it very disarming. And I think it did change something in me. And I, I, I think it was the moment when the political hat came off and suddenly, instead of a political obligation as a Republican, it was a personal obligation as a human being who'd cause pain, you know. I think that's, I've spent the last 14 years trying to think what happened in that room at that moment. It was a hinge moment in my life. And somewhere in the mixture I've described is what was going on. But we both felt at the uh, end of that meeting, after these three hours, that, well, we went our separate ways, but I think troubled by it or, you know, fired up by it to the point where we realized we had to meet again. Separately, we raved at that. We had to meet again. This was a dialogue that needed to be continued. If something was happening here, something positive was happening. And as I said, uh, 14 years later, after 130 or more meetings, we're here, and Joe still has this trust in the process and in me to return to this dialogue. And I, uh, well, I, I feel I have to honour that, you know, something that honour. I can't think of anything else I can do in terms of a contribution to um, dealing with the past, dealing with the conflict, dealing with our obligations because of our role in the past, than continuing this dialogue and hoping that it might act as an example to others. I'm um, not being prescriptive. We're not saying do what we do, but what we're saying we think, we hope that it might encourage or spur others to, do, to be similarly open to the potential of just dialogue, meeting as two human beings talking about a horrible past. Thanks, Pat. Um, I want to acknowledge your courage in being here and still coming to share with me when I know that it is emotionally difficult, especially being today in Brighton. I really appreciate it and there's nowhere more I want to be than here with all of you today. Um, I remember during that year we met so many times and it was a very private meeting and then we got to the point of going public, which was a really big decision and it involved both of us speaking to our friends and our, our family, and with me especially my five siblings, my stepmother, my mother, wondering whether it was the right thing to do. Was it going to help or was it going to bring more trauma up? But we went ahead and we were asked to speak very soon after the documentary went out. We were asked to speak in London. We were given like three minutes each, so this is not a lot of time. But I remember the words that Patrick said still, um, I can still hear them. He said, I now know I could have sat down and had a cup of tea with Joe's dad. So that's the first time he said that to me. And yes, I can imagine the, the two of them sitting and having a cup of tea. And of course, the Conservative government weren't into having cups of tea with the IRA, I know that. But for me, to imagine the two of them is very healing and also inspirational because if we were all having those cups of tea, 
and those connections and dialogue, then violence can be prevented. People often thank me for um, the fact that I can forgive Patrick, and some people tell me it's a pity that I can't forgive him. So it's not a word that I like to use because it means different things to different people. But the key learning for me, and I remember the times when I've, I've heard so much of what happened to Patrick and his community on the street back in Belfast. And I've reached a place in me of knowing that if I'd been Patrick, would I have made the same choices? You know, I don't know. Would I have joined the non-violent peace group? Would I have joined the IRA? I don't know which way I would have gone. Would I have been somebody who just left the country? I could have done all those things. And I had that experience with the ex-British soldier who was there, and with the ex-lawless paramilitary who was there. And that makes me see that when I really listen to people's story, then there is no other. There is only us human beings struggling with whatever we've been given in life to you be heard, to make a difference. And in the, with that understanding, there is nothing to forgive. There's just that understanding, that empathy. That means more to me than forgiveness. I've also been learning about my own violence, which maybe you find that difficult to see. But actually, it's about me every moment and choosing to acknowledge the fact that I still want to hurt people. I still want to blame people. I still want to make someone else wrong and me right. It's about giving that up, giving up that sense of righteousness, giving up that need to make someone wrong, and listening and seeing the humanity of all. And for that, Patrick's been an incredible teacher. You know, in after the first um, initial meetings, which spawned, say, a couple of months, um, I heard a lot about Joe's father. Um, she shared a lot with me. And that's incredible, isn't it? Um, I find it incredible after all these years. And a, a picture of this this uh, this mom um, began to emerge. But you've got to remember that um, to me, and it's a cruel word, he was a cipher. Um, he was an unknown. Um, when we targeted Braden, we were targeting the Tories. You know, those we held responsible. And we weren't looking beyond that. So we are dealing with a very, I guess, and reduced view. And we were the people who felt the most keenly stereotyped, um, as, as I said earlier. We felt that there was a total distortion and misrepresentation in all the media about what we were involved in and were about. And there was a realisation that came from Joe talking about her father that I was as guilty as those we would have pointed the finger out and said that they were dehumanising us. I was guilty of having this um, reduced view of the enemy. We didn't see beyond the uniform. We didn't see the people, you know, were in the uniform. We didn't. We didn't see beyond, you know, the uh, the flags. We didn't see beyond the political allegiances. I think that's um, possibly a necessary uh, consequence of being in conflict. It necessarily naturally follows that the conflict itself throws up barriers to you appreciating uh, the uh, humanity of, of the other. And if perhaps the, if there's a way out of it, one of the ways out of it is to start to reduce those barriers, cut back on them, try to really open up to the humanity of the others. Never let yourself fall into the trap of this reduced view. Keep on striving to open your mind to the possibilities of the other's point of view, etc. And as I said, uh, I'm listening to Joe, I'm watching Joe, I'm gaining this impression of her father, and I'm gaining this impression of Joe. Uh, struck at a very early stage, uh, you know, uh, what a fine woman this is. Um, 
a mo- lot of that, most of it, must have come from her father. Yeah. And I killed this guy. I killed this man. So, in other words, I killed a fine human being. And, uh, well, that became a measure of the loss. You know, and it's a, it's a heavy thing to carry. And it cuts through all the um, objectivity, the motivations, etc., the reason, the political reason. The fact is, people were hurt and killed, and it creates an enormous conflict within me. And I'm guessing, I know it's not a guess, when everybody is caught up in conflict, no matter what they say, what the motivations, etc., that they, they're. Uh, Feeling perhaps that they're doing good, feeling they're making some sort of contribution to peace or to the uh, building, and yet in doing that, hurting people, doing damage, killing people, and that's a conflict that I don't think um, it's possible to square. There's no square in that circle. You know, you can stand over my actions. I can stand over my actions. I think I can objectively look at the past and examine the, uh, the options faced to us and arrive at conclusions about that. It doesn't matter if you can justify the past. We still have this burden that people are hurt. It's a heavy consequence of conflict, etc. And for that very reason, this is, is an incentive in my life to try to do something to explain and hopefully discourage others from taking that path, or at least spending uh, more attention to the options open to them in any given situation of uh, grievance. Thank you. So we have some, some minutes. Kai, are you going to facilitate this? Any questions, any responses? We have a roving microphone. Thank you. I have two roving microphones, which Andy and I are going to be walking around with in case there are questions, in case there are reflections or things that you would like to share. What I would like to do is to give people a a space for a moment to think about that, to think about what it is in terms of when you've heard Joe and Pat speak now, what does that make you think? What are your own thoughts or questions in relation to the experience which they've shared? As you do that, I would also like to to ask you both, Joe and Patrick, you each have the deep experience of the conflict and the troubles in Northern Ireland. And I know also since the time you first met, you've traveled together and shared your experience in many other contexts. I think you've both traveled together to Rwanda And I know that you've also spoken in Israel-Palestine and in Lebanon and elsewhere. I've spent the last 20 years living and working in areas affected by armed conflict and in war zones. And we're in a moment today in the world where we can see deep dynamics that you spoke of, of creating enemy images, of stereotypes of the others, of legitimizing or believing that violence is the solution or the only path or what we have to use. And part of what is bringing us here today is not only to recognize and commemorate what happened 30 years ago and to recognize and to honor the journey and the story that you've just shared, but also as all of us here together to think, how do we go beyond this? And in that context, I'd like to ask you for your thoughts and for what you would like to share with us as you look at what's happening in the world today, as you look at decisions being taken by governments and as you look at the mobilization that is happening in more and more communities for people to see others as an enemy and as a threat. What do you feel needs to be done? Just a a few thoughts on that, Kai. I heard a few days ago um, a woman from Brighton, a mother, 
whose son was killed in Syria a week or two weeks ago. And what I heard from her was just a little bit of story about her son and what happened in the family and her wish that they weren't judged or blamed or demonized. And I, th I think it's up to all of us when we hear the stories of, of people doing dreadful things around the world to just wonder what was behind it, what was going on in that person's life. And for us all to know that we're all positive change makers, we can all make a difference and that's why I know we're all here today. And I'm just thinking of the challenges that especially young people have and the passion for injustice, the, the need to belong and to connect. And that that was also Patrick as a young man. And because of the lack of choices around, Patrick chose violence as do other people. And we all need to work together to make sure there are more choices. And it's not just about changing the culture of, of war and of violence. It's about creating infrastructures of peace so at every level we have ways and people can learn about peace building. And I think we can all make a difference. I think um, everybody in this room, I'd, I'm preaching to the converted when I say that the What's needed is inclusion and dialogue and compromise. Um, broad stroke, we all know that's what's achieved, but it's in a world where these are scarce commodities when there's so many barriers to those, you know, ideas, those practices. And because there's a power imbalance in every conflict situation, you know, if it, if it was just a case of two even bodies, you know, you, they can. You, know, you can imagine picking surrogates and going having a scrap in the corner or arm wrestling. It's not like that. It's there's real imbalances that lead to grievances. And these have to be addressed. So you have to create a situation where you can somehow, you know, make up for that imbalance. For me, that means and I would draw on the experience of the the Irish peace process realize and come to the realization you can't do it all on your own you know but you have to have a counterweight to the power of our enemy the, you know the british state that was done by you know forging links with the you know other power groups irish america um europe etc people in this country who you know supported us and just building that up so you build up the counterbalance. That's what you have to do. And when you've achieved that, when you achieve the counterbalance, then the dialogue can begin. You know, real dialogue can begin. I think that's what's needed in any conflict I, I, I can see. And it's perhaps uh, um, can be universally applied in any situation of conflict, whether it's personal or communal level. Uh, I think that's all I can say about that. As I'm saying, it's lovely to. I mean, of course, I believe in dialogue and inclusion. Not always easy unless you can build up the size, create that space, that space for safe dialogue. Um, I have a, an observation, first of all, and then a question for both of you. Is that okay? Okay. Um, my observation, my thoughts are that um, I feel profoundly moved by listening to you both. Very, very grateful to be here today. I feel humbled by this experience and have felt moved to work to help people to focus on being able to put their likes, dislikes and prejudices to one side, to being able to understand each other, particularly when there's conflict. Um, jo, my question to you is that you talked about the anger in you, and my question is, what enabled you to stop from focusing on the anger and focusing on the understanding? 
um, my my commitment right from the beginning was to not let my anger hurt another human being, just break that cycle of violence and revenge. But there were times when I have felt anger and rage, and I've been very blessed to have opportunities, uh, especially at Glen Free Recreation Centre in Ireland, to share my story. I think sharing stories is a very powerful way of releasing emotions in a safe way. And there was a time in 2000 where I had a lot of experiences of being heard. But other than that, I really believe that it's the story I'm telling myself with my anger. So if I'm feeling some of the anger and the pain, the story I tell myself is that I have an enemy. I have someone who's made me feel like this. It's their reason my life is a mess and chaos. Then that keeps the anger going and keeps me linked to the enemy. So I made sure the stories I was telling myself was about I can release this, you know, I'm doing okay, I can transform this, I can move on. So it's partly the story in my head that I work with, and then it's partly finding ways to express the anger so it's creative, so it's, it's releasing rather than destructive. And that's something that I'm still learning. If you ask my daughters, they'll say that I'm not always very good at it. But it is ways about sometimes playing music or dancing or being in nature or meditating or throwing stones into the sea, many, many ways. And I think my anger has actually helped me to get up on those days when I'm feeling so down. You know, there are times when I wanted to give up and it's the anger that's got me going again. You know, the anger at the injustice I see of people being hurt get me up and, and moving. So it's also been a positive. Thank you. Um, Patrick, if it's okay that I ask you a question. Sure. Um, okay. I've got here, do you understand yourself now as you were and forgive yourself for the decisions you made at the time, as I believe so many others would have done had they been in your position? Well, it's a short question, but a deeply complex question and uh, needs to be unpicked a bit as we talk about forgiveness and I'm not too sure where that fits in with where I am at or my understanding of myself. Um, let's deal with that for one for to start. Uh, well, I don't even know what forgiveness means. I, I don't. Um, I should say that I'm, I'm not a religious person. And that word has its keenest uh, association in my mind with religious belief. It's something that Christians are advised to do, and I'm sure other belief systems. Um, so I, I, I can't get my head around it really because I, I don't have those views. Um, I, I met a guy, uh, somebody who was very uh, badly shaken and injured in Brighton, uh, Harvey Thomas, who's a, who is a Christian, a very sincere guy. And I've met him and we've become friends and we've shared platforms and we've explored these issues. Now he forgave me. He wrote to me while I was in prison and said that from his Chris, because of his Christian beliefs, he was writing to forgive me. And when you read that, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to pick holes in it and wondering where exactly this guy is coming from. But I've met him on so many occasions, and I'm absolutely convinced when he said he forgive me, he meant it, whatever it is that he means. You know, I'm not trying to uh, detract from that. He means it. He's forgiven me and he's moved on. I can't do that. I just can't do it. Uh, don't understand it. I... I and I wouldn't seek forgiveness uh, to explore this further because uh, well, things I did in the past, I did in full conscience, made decisions, and acted on them, and I thought they were justified. You know, live with the consequences. But uh, I'm saying for that very reason, I don't see how I could seek forgiveness. Uh, again, the best I think that's achievable is to uh, achieve an understanding. Going back to appreciation of my own motivations, etc. I, I, you get to my age and you can't help but look back over the past and um, you know, reappraise decisions made at a, an earlier time. And I've been doing more than that. I've been trying to put things down on paper to really get into it, and I'm not there yet. I'm, I mean, you, every time, for instance, I would get into conversation with my mother, I'm seeing things in a different light. If you grow up with a, a you know, this. Uh, really fictitious picture of what what your childhood and so you're, you're you know you're relearning you're relearning and uh, that's what I, I'm doing 
I, I think that's a, it's going to take me a long time to get to understanding me, really. I have a better sense of it now for applying myself to the task of doing that. But uh, I can't say I've arrived at that point where I understand. You know, it's, and I think it's important to. I can put myself back and uh, part of my reasoning then becomes evident, you know. But I know so much more now, you know. That, so it's, it's, this is a, a real exploration for me. Um, I've got many, is that all right? Am I using the microphone okay? I've got many um, insights that I would like to share and questions that I would like to ask, but the one that is uppermost in my mind is this is an event for young people. Um, I'm here with two young people aged 18 and 19. Um, and I'm aware that 30 years ago when this incident happened, both of you were young people or relatively young people. And I would really like to have a little bit of an understanding of young Joe and young Patrick, how you were at that time. Um, obviously, you were both exceptional young people um, in different ways. And you have developed into exceptional older people and I think you're really inspiring for people of all ages but I would really like to know if you if you are willing to and able to just kind of give us a bit of an idea of young Joe and young Patrick put yourself back 30 years for a moment which I realize you know is is an emotional thing for you to do um, and I really appreciate your courage and what you're what you're sharing with us, but what would you say to young people from the perspective of young Joe and young Patrick, and from the perspective that you're at now? A message. When I put myself back thirty years, I was uh, thirty-three, so I wasn't that young. Um, a bit wizened, you know. Um, if I put myself back to um, the age when I made the decision to join the that the struggle. It's perhaps more relevant considering the age of people in the room. Um, well, I was a product of the sixties, um, where there seemed to be so much potential. You know, you know, our generation could change the world, and uh, things were happening. You know, in, in Paris, events in Paris, the Prague Spring civil rights movement in the states, etc. You know. Everybody was concerned about what was happening in Vietnam. So we're all highly politicized then. I think we were. Perhaps more than many subsequent generations. And we all felt though, and this is the important thing, this new generation, you know, after the, the Second World War, that we could change it. You know, we, we could make a difference. And, uh, and suddenly, in my case, Ireland erupted. and. Uh, all my decisions uh, from then were centered there. What I could do to make a change there, you know. But but I, I, I'm saying I, I was somebody who motivated and wanting to make a change, wanting to make a change in the world. And uh, I get a sense today that you know that, that that motivation is still there amongst young people, you know, in, in powerful ways. Some it's like that, isn't it? It was we've been uneven going down the generations. But I think we're one of those heights heights again where people are very uh, politically aware and in a situation like that I think what you have to do is try to understand the world as much as possible and you are never been in a better position to understand the world given the rate of communications etc and then you know um, armed you know with that you know, with a real understanding not rushing in to make decisions how you can make a contribution uh, when I think back about it uh, we were um, trying to learn in the dark. I mean, okay, we had the TV for the first time, so we had images of what was happening, for instance, in the southern states of the USA, and we could relate to the plight of, you know, black Americans, you know, fighting for their civil rights. Uh, but even, but still, um, you wonder to the extent uh, where we see in the, uh, uh, how 
I don't know how we could have benefited from a fuller picture with more information. So I think there's a lot of possibilities for this new, this new generation. You know? Thank you. Um, I, yes, I think I'll share the, the me before the bomb went off about who I was. Um, so I spent a couple of years living in the Himalayas in a, in a hut with no electric and no running water. <laughs> and it's a very important time because I was finding myself and bring to, to dream of a world of, of peace. And I was studying um, about non-violence, studying what peace was. And during that time, I thought that the way to change the world was through inner peace. And so in my own way, not belonging to any, any spiritual group or any religious group, I was on a journey to find um, inner peace. Inner peace isn't something I, I don't know, I don't believe in it anymore. I think it's, it's a definitely a journey, which in those days I thought was something I could attain. And I remember sitting one day in this beautiful place and thinking what I really wanted to know about with my life was what love was and what love in the sense of unconditional love. And I thought my life was going to be in living in India, away from the West. And to me looking back, I think actually what I have been learning about I could not have learned any better. Um, and so there's a sort of feeling I can connect with a young me who was sort of living on a mountain top and had to go right off that mountain top into the darkness of pain. In those days I could just attach myself. When the bomb went up, I was in that pain. And I think the message is, for me, it's about we all have a story. We all have trauma. And it is possible. We can transform it. We can bring something positive. And that's what I've been learning about. And I think we all have that Thank you. I'd like to ask Patrick, um, if at, at the point when you made the decision to join the IRA, um, wh whether you'd seen any kind of non-violent options available to you, or, or if you had, would you have taken them rather than joining a violent service? Well, I'll go back to when I was that age again. I mean, I was I was twenty when I joined the uh, IRA, and uh, but in the years, a couple of years prior to that, you know, it was this guy who very bolshy actually. You know, like you sit and talk politics all the time. He was interested in politics, and in an uninformed type of way. And uh, I'd have called myself a pacifist, but I was a pacifist in that sense of being anti, for example, what's happened in Vietnam. You're anti-militaristic. You're anti, you know, violence. This big state violence. Um, to the, if, I don't know, avoided conflict, avoided violence, other than arguing and politics. Uh, not a good way. But uh, I, I think I would have felt, you know, like part, part of this new movement that saw an alternative to violence. You know, that civil rights would work, could work, it seemed to work, to be working in the States. Back in Ireland, it really did make a change. It put the whole issues confronting us as a like, beleaguered minority in Ireland to the front of the you know the political agenda, and offered a way out, marching you know uh, you know get being heard in that way. And uh, I wanted to be a part of that. And when I returned to Ireland, because I spent a lot of years in England, but when, uh, age nineteen, I thought I would like to be part of that certainly did not return to Ireland to get involved in the IRA. And, uh, but then when you see, uh, see, when I saw what was happening on the ground, um, I changed my views of it, on it. It seemed to me at that time that the options weren't there. The civil rights options seemed to have been shot and beaten off the streets. And there was a real need for defense. I mean, people were being attacked and I saw how the community responded to that, you know, the violence, the, and uh, and I wanted to be. I ended up deciding to be part of that response to violence. You know, so I joined the IRA. You know, I mean, what the people think and people have been brought up uh, to, to believe that the IRA is um, something's nearly parachuted into this, uh, external to you know people's lives. If it only would get rid of the IRA, everything would be good. In fact, the IRA were the people in those districts, and uh, it was seemed to me the most natural decision to make 
after a long, hard thinking process, big decisions have to be made before you make that decision. But I see, it, it's as I'm saying, I, I was, uh, I guess, and you could say I was a product of that age, you know, that time and those circumstances. Perhaps then, given that a slight modification to it, in your personal experience, what's been the benefit of being able to engage in this dialogue, not just with each other, but to you tour the world, engaging this conversation with, in so many different venues and so many different audiences? What's the benefit of third parties that have added to your personal experience mm -hmm. in this dialogue? Okay. Well, I remember the first day uh, we were in Israel and Palestine, we were speaking to combatants for peace and we were in this quite old hotel in, in Palestine and I was looking around at all these amazing people there and all of them were sharing the, the difficulties they were having in being non-violent when violence was happening to them. And I remember thinking, what, what are we doing here? Why are we speaking here? Like, what difference can we make? I'm really doubting why we were there. And then the answer came. A new conversation started. People that were there heard their conflict reflected back in a different way. Partly because they felt that we cared about them, but partly it allowed a different conversation to start. That to me is what it's about. It's about we're sharing our journey and our dialogue to create a safe place where everyone is safe to say whatever they're thinking or whatever they're feeling. And every time we speak, there's a different conversation with different people. Um, and it's always different. You know, it's never, never the same. So it's about sparking off a new conversation. Yeah, and I think I mentioned before that we don't come here with answers. Uh, we're not sitting here thinking we've got it all solved and you know, this, is the, this is the format, you know, this is the template you can bring into any situation of conflict. This is an exploration for us. And where we failed, sometimes we, we, we've been doing this 14 years and you, you wonder what progress we've actually made in this dialogue. But then progress comes more times than enough from engagement with the audience, that a question from the audience, a piece of advice from the audience, a metaphor, uh, something that they've introduced into the, the event, you know, just sparks something there and it moves it on for us. So that's a three-way process. It's always got to come from that. You know, any form of dialogue, it's always better than somebody else bringing something to the table. You know. And just to add, you know, I go back to the me that want to create something positive out of out of what had happened, and you know, I'm thinking of the woman in Rwanda. We went to Rwanda with John Paul Sampiti, who's here, and there was a woman there who, who said, she didn't know there were others like her. She thought she was alone, and that that changed her. Or the person in Sarajevo from Mexico who said he now knows what's possible. So he's going back to his challenges, knowing that this is possible. That two people who could be enemies are sitting and listening with respect and dignity. And that also seems to be a big part of it. Thank you very much, Joe and Pat. Do you want to jump on? Yeah, I think the, the good question he asked, I have to, to add something because Joe and Pat, they came to Rwanda and um, uh, as a survivor of genocide uh, in Rwanda, it's hard for you know you know when you are in a country they say there's no prophet in his own country you know, even if we speak about forgiveness uh, it's hard uh, but when they came to Rwanda it was easy for me and it was easy for Rwandans now to understand that if these people have been together, if they are reconciled, now we understand, now we can also forgive each other. Because it was hard to talk about forgiveness, but when they came, it helped. People were telling, oh, Jean-Paul, now, now you're right. Now we understand. You know when somebody comes from, and also in, in, um, in Africa, to people from outside to convince to convince them 
when they came to Rwanda, it they helped. It I was like encouraged. I was empowered. I could now go everywhere talking about forgiveness without problem, without now uh, worried, being worried that some people don't understand. I was very, very encouraged. This I think this will answer your question. Thank you very much, Joe and Patrick. Um, Joe and Patrick, all of the people who are speaking throughout the day are going to be with us throughout the entire day. And we're going to have opportunities also during the lunch in many different settings and at the cafe afterwards to be able to sit and to, to discuss and to go deeper. When, um, when Joe was discussing her vision for the day, and we were speaking about bringing people who have had direct experience in being involved in using violence in pursuit of, of struggles or causes or in different spaces that they were in and people who were survivors and had experienced this violence. That was something incredibly powerful. But Joe, you were also saying that you wanted us to go one step further and to fit into the space of this day together some very practical and concrete training and sessions in peace building and doing that together to be looking at drawing from our own experiences and drawing from experiences in dealing with conflict around the world and also learning a little bit about what is being done and having the chance to hear and discuss together what do you want to do and also what are you involved in so I want to say thank you very much to Joe and Pat for what you've shared. And then we're going to move into what... Thank you. Thank you.